إن الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على سيد المصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن ولا وبعد فإن أستقى الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحديث هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أيها الإخوة الكرام وأخوات السيدات السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his great ni'mah to be chosen to be Muslims in this day and in this time and under these circumstances and in this part of the world in which we have the ultimate ability to challenge the word of kuf and shirk and to raise the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make it ula and to pronounce Islam as a system and to be able to say without any compromise that Islam is a better way. To be able to stand in the court of the Fir'aun and the Fir'aunic people and to say to them, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And without any fear, to say to them that Islam is a better way <coughs> and to say to them as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said inna dina inda Allah al-Islam very the system chosen by Allah and preferred by Allah and made legitimate by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the human beings is nothing other than Islam. And we Muslims in the Western world or living under Western culture, living under the influence of Westernized government, we Muslims who are living as minorities, We are the wealthiest Muslims. We are the healthiest Muslims. We are the most educated Muslims. We are the most liberated Muslims. But unfortunately, we are the weakest and we are the quietest and we are the most afraid. And this is why the situation of Muslims and Islam being misconstrued is so tragic. Because Muslims in other governments, other places, other lands, they cannot stand up and say a word. Not a word. Even they cannot gather as we are gathered tonight. The masjids in those lands are not for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The masjids are in the hands of the tyrants, the puppets, those who have been chosen to lead the Muslims who themselves are mufsideen and fasiqeen and dhalimeen. And those mufsideen, fasiqeen, 
ظالمين منافقين they have killed more muslims than all the kuffar government together muslim tyrants who have been selected and handpicked by the kuffar themselves have put in prison and killed and repressed more muslims in the last 100 years than all the kuffar governments have done together but those muslims in those countries and you know what i mean because some of you have come from those countries you have fled from those countries or you have been pushed from those countries and you have come here saying to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on your way here on the boat or on the plane that if you came to a place of safety you would practice islam but once you arrived and allah gave you the safety you do nothing except come to the masjid and pray and you do nothing else and this is what we need to talk about no islam is not terrorist religion and the muslims are not terrorists islam is not fanatic religion and we are not fanatics islam is not extremist religion and we are not extremist islam does not allow suicide and we don't support suicide bombers This is very clear, but this is not the issue. The issue is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will repay the kuffar for what they say. And He has already said, they intend to blow out and extinguish the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by blowing with their mouths. So what is blowing with their mouths? It is slander. It is lying. It is the manufacturing of mistruths and misinformation. It is the dissemination of their media, which is global and thorough. Newspapers, magazines, cinema, radio, every way they are sending out their words, their images, their sounds, and this is what the law means by blowing with their mouths. And they're doing everything they can do to enter the hearts of Muslims, to paralyze them, to frighten them, to quiet them, and to tell the rest of the world, Islam and Muslims, they are filthy. They are devils, they are dirty, they are heathens, they want to kill you, they want to dominate the world, they are like vermin, they are like rats, and we have to be careful of them so that when they destroy the Muslim lands and enter the Muslim lands and rob and pillage the Muslims and rape the non-Muslims in those lands, they won't say anything because they will say they are just rats and they are just vermin and they are just terrorists and they are fanatics and we have to control them in some way. That's what they do it for. But the issue is, we Muslims, we are right in their faces. We are working with them. We are going to school with them. We are living with them. Our children are being taught by them. And we are eating with them and smiling with them and enjoying their civilization and asking them for asylum and safety. And we are changing our names and bowing our heads as if to say, you are right about what you say about us. But so long as you don't bother me and allow me to become strong and enjoy your society, it's okay. Because silence is consent. 
If a man came to ask you for your daughter in marriage, if you didn't like him, and he was inappropriate for your daughter, but he asked for her hand in marriage, and she was present, and you said nothing, and she said nothing, it means you have accepted. And so the Muslims who say nothing, they have accepted the condition by silence. And by silence, they have become in complicity. That means you have been added to the list of people who support what they say by your silence. Now to do other than silence doesn't mean we have the right to act as criminals. We don't ever have the right to be act as criminals. We don't have the right to violate the law. We don't have the right to act in a way in which the Prophet ﷺ did not act. We don't have the right to curse them. We don't have the right to publicly disrespect them. We don't have the right to bomb or to rob or to steal or to disobey the civil laws. We don't have the right to do that because the Prophet ﷺ didn't give the companions who went to Habesh he didn't give them that right. Even though that king, he was a Christian, he was a mushrik, he didn't give them the right to disobey him civilly. He didn't give the right of Muslims to disrespect him. So I am not suggesting in any way that Muslims living as minorities have the right to publicly disrespect, disobey the civil law, not to act as citizens. We must. But we have to use our individual right, our individual resources, our individual vote, our individual support and dignity, and our collective person to say no. We don't support that policy. No. What you're saying is a lie. No. Islam is a system established by Allah, verified by the Qur'an, manifested by the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And Islam is a better way. And Muslims in their lands are sacred and that their blood is sacred. And the taking of the Muslim blood and the occupying of their lands is a criminal act. We have to say it. Now, there is an issue, we say, of terrorism. We don't have to discuss Islam versus terrorism because Islam supports nothing other than itself. Al-Islamu istislamu lillahi bitawheed wal inqiyadu lahu bitawati. Al-Islam is nothing other than istislam. Submission to Allah and his legislation according to the rules of monotheism. And surrendering to his sharia, to his ahkam, without any reservation. Completely surrendering with obedience. This is Islam. And Islam has its sources which can never be changed until the Day of Judgment. And that is the Qur'an and that is the Sunnah. So that is one side. Now terrorism is something else. But to treat this issue properly and objectively, we first need to define what is terrorism. No one can make their own definition of terrorism because the definition doesn't change from day to day and time to time and place to place. An apple is an apple in China and it does not become an orange in America. And a president of the United States or a president of Europe 
state or president of Australia or president of any country doesn't change the name of terrorism or the meaning of it because of his idea. It is a definition. And according to the language, it has to remain a definition. So if we go to any English dictionary, take the Funk and Wagner, take Webster's, take the Oxford, the highest classical dictionaries in the world for the English language and see what is the definition of terrorism. Not a definition that just came 70 years ago. Not the definition which just came 50 years ago or 20 years ago. Not the definition that the Americans give or that the British give or the Australians give or the French give or the Germans give. Not a special definition. No, let's go back to the definition with the Oxford, the Webster, the Funk and Wagner dictionary has given for the last 200 years. The definition of terrorism, and listen very carefully, because after we get the definition, we're going to speak about some actions which have been done in the last 200 years since this definition has been made, and you will tell me, is this actions of terrorism or is it not? It says, terrorism, the act of protracted or spontaneous inflicting of systematic attacks and assaults and intrusions upon individuals and places within human populations with the purpose of instilling fear and trauma. This so-called politi politicization of this terminology, because this terminology by the, by the United Nations and the G8 countries, that is the countries that are the most developed nations in the world, they have politicized this terminology. They have politicized this definition. In the last 30 years, they have made a special definition for this. But let's go back 200 years and let us see. In the last 200 years, and I want you to add up the numbers as we move along, because those numbers at the end will tell you who have been guilty of terrorism in the last 200 years. The numbers I'm going to give you are the numbers of people that have been systematically slaughtered and destabilized, liquefied, or otherwise eliminated. Let's start out with the invasion of South America by the Portuguese and Spanish conquistadors and in that incursion which took place in the 18th century they slaughtered systematically destabilized and otherwise eliminated 56 million people in South America in order to take control of that continent, and they are still holding that continent today. 56 million. How did they do it? Through the act of inflicting systematic attacks and assaults with their armies and their weapons upon individuals and places with human populations with the purpose of instilling fear, fear and trauma. What is that definition? Terrorism. Let's talk about Christopher Columbus on behalf of his Spanish king, 
Ferdinand and his Ferdinand and his French prostitute wife Isabella. Christopher Columbus was given the crown jewels of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. They sold their crown jewels to some Jewish merchants who built the boats that Christopher Columbus took headed towards what he called India. You know the story. And he was a fool. And those Jewish navigators who were on the boat with him, they knew that he was a fool. And they knew that once they got out on the ocean, they could not drink the ocean water. But he was a fool. He didn't know that you could not drink the salt water. So those Jewish navigators, they took lemons and lime with them, which lemons and lime will deactivate the salt. So they used to drink it and desalinate the water. But they allowed Christopher Columbus and his crew to drink the water, and they caught something called rickets, and most of them died. So those Jewish navigators, they took him where they wanted to take him, which was what we call now the Americas. Because those Jewish navigators, that's where they wanted to go. Because they had the maps from the Muslims. So they knew where to go. Because they had lived with the Muslims in Spain for more than 600 years. And they knew how to sail the ocean. And they arrived at a place called the Americas. But Christopher Columbus, he survived. But the fool that he was, he still called the place India. And so even today, how arrogant they are, they still call the people in my country, the native people of my country, they still call them Indians. And let me tell you, after Christopher Columbus came back and claimed that land for King Ferdinand and Isabella, they sent more ships. And within 150 years, they destabilized, massacred, killed, liquidated, eliminated 89 million native Indians, as they called them, to take control of what they call the New World. So we got 56 and we got 89. You keep adding for me, please. And what did they do? They inflicted systematic attacks and assaults with their weapons and their ships and their boats and their armies upon individuals and places within human populations with the purpose of instilling fear and trauma. And what is that definition? Terrorism. Their definition. It's not Khalid's definition. It's their definition, which is in the Oxford Dictionary, the Webster Dictionary, the Funk and Wagner Dic Dictionary, all established authorities in their language their definition. And after them came the French on the other side of what is called the Americas. The French came from the side which is called California. And the French, they came. And along with the Dutch and the French, they added another 28 million to the number that had already been destabilized, liquefied, and otherwise eliminated. We move on to the land called Africa. Those who had occupied the Americas knew that their own people, their own populations, could not do the work that was necessary to build up that country. They needed a new workforce. And so, along with the British and the Dutch and the French and the Spanish, 
the Americans concocted a deal. They said, let us build boats and let us also make whiskey and let us also make guns. So with guns and whiskey and boats, we can barter and trade and we can go to Africa and take those dark-skinned black heathens, put them in boats, bring them to Europe, to America, in what was called the triangle trade. From Africa to the Americas, to Europe, back to Africa, this is a triangle. And so for 400 years, I said, not a hundred years, not a century, not two, not three, but 400 years, they woefully trafficked in human cargo. And they took out of Africa 180 million people, like dogs and rats, putting them in the bottom of ships and keeping them there for the three or four months that it took for that triangle trade to complete itself, realizing that only 23 out of 100 of those slaves inside the ship would survive. So they made sure that the cost of those 23 slaves would pay for the whole shipment. Where did the other 77 slaves wind up? in the graveyard of the Atlantic Ocean. <clears throat> so you take 70% of 180 million. You are intelligent people. Take 70% of 180 million over 400 years, and they are in the bottom of the Atlantic. The other 30% of 180 million the 52 million they brought and put between Europe, the Caribbean, and the Americas. So now you add 180 million to already 86 and 17 and 59. Somebody just keep adding. And let me give you the definition of what they did. <coughs> the act of inflicting systematic attacks and assaults upon individuals and places within human populations with the purpose of instilling fear and trauma. And what does that mean? Terrorism. We don't want to even mention what they did inside the Congo, inside the continent. We don't want to have to mention what they did in South Africa. The Afrikaners, the Boers, who came from Germany into Africa, who systematically slaughtered and displaced and enslaved 39 million people in South Africa. Who were the natives? And held that position that they were a God-given population who had the right to dominate those heathens. And this was known as apartheid. And the world, the United Nations, accepted it. All the way until how long ago? Just eight, nine, ten years ago, apartheid was an acceptable form of government in the world, although it came out of what kind of action? The act of inflicting systematic attacks and assaults upon individuals and places within human populations with the purpose of instilling fear and trauma. What is that definition? <clears throat> and let's come to this good land of Australia. In case you Muslims who are immigrants 
Even, even if you immigrated 80 years ago, you're still an immigrant. Now, I know you say, no, 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 I'm Australian, I'm naturalized. But let me give you a little history, because I'm a history person. I'm a sociologist, and so I study these things to understand human behavior. I study them to understand the behavior, the development, the evolution of societies. And right outside your door, 50 miles in any given direction from Sydney, 50 miles in any given direction outside of Sydney, you can easily find, maybe not even 50 miles, you will find settlements of native people who are called aboriginals. Very nice, complicated word, isn't it? Aboriginals. They are the people who own this land, have more right to this land than anyone else, according to the provisions of God. Not the provisions of the United Nations, not the provisions of those who came here, who displaced them systematically and replaced them systematically. Now today, I know the aboriginals, they are a pitiful people. And we blame them now. We say they drink grog all day. They shoot drugs all day. They are ignorant. They are dirty. They are lazy. They are shiftless. They don't want to change their condition. The opportunity is there for them like everybody else, but they don't want to change. And so, since they don't want to change, obviously they must deserve their condition. Who they have to blame? Nobody but themselves. We are taught that.